Thanks a lot to Lee and Jessica for inviting me to talk some about some of our research uh, to this group. Um, I am going to try to keep it fairly straightforward. Not too, no, no, only one formula. Um, and uh, feel free to ask questions, raise your hand, ask questions as we're going along here. Um, this picture there happens to be hybrid rye. Um, this is hybrid rye. This is one of our wheat varieties. And uh, the reason that picture is up there is because when I was in uh, Germany uh, about a month ago, I was giving a talk, talk at KWS, which is the company that developed these hybrid ryes. And, and uh, th what's spectacular about these uh, hybrid varieties is that they out yield the best open pollinated rye variety by 30% and they yield my best wheat variety by 50%. So these, uh, th this, uh, this is really something uh, very interesting. And they don't lodge. They don't get diseases. It's just, they're truly a, truly a spe spectacular uh, new crop. That's beside the point, though. Today, I'm going to talk about genomic selection. Um, I'm going to. Um, First, give an introduction to what genomic selection is about, a little bit about um, how we use uh, whole genome genotyping to deal with genotype by environment inter uh, interactions, a little bit about how I visualize uh, GS being integrated in a breeding program, the differences between the biparental versus open multifamily strategy, uh, some uh, of Jessica's work on recurrent selection, recurrent genomic selection for adult plant resistance. And I was going to present some work on, on uh, using whole genome genotyping for yield trials, but I'm afraid that's going to push it too long, so I'm going to leave that part off. Sorry, Mark, can you go back? Yeah. What is this uh, Jensen from the left side, this picture? Oh. That's one of my earlier varieties. Um, it was named, from, named after my predecessor, uh, Neil Jensen, who was the wheat breeder at Cornell before I, before I went there. Um, it's an inter interesting variety because it, it combined moderate resistance to fusarium head blight with moderate resistance to pre-harvest sprouting. OK, so um, plant breeding is a predictive science. Everything we do in plant breeding is trying to predict something. And uh, new uh, breeding strategies are driven by new technologies and new knowledge. So when we have new tools, we develop new strategies. Um, when, when we're doing yield trials, we're trying to pre predict performance in a farmer's field. We're trying to use um, uh, quality information to predict how these uh, varieties are going to perform in, in, a, in a flour mill or in a baking shop. And over time, plant breeders have developed methods to improve their prediction accuracy, improve heritability. Um, and some of those methods include family selection methods, progeny testing. And then more recently, uh, with the uh, introduction of molecular markers, um, we are taking advantage of that new tool to improve our selection for both qualitative and now quantitative traits. OK, so in, in molecular breeding strategies, we're, we're really trying to, first of all, discover new alleles. And we characterize those alleles and identify those that are positive, positively influencing the traits we're interested in. And then we try to combine those superior alleles uh, in a single genotype to realize transgressive segregation for that trait. Now, some of you probably saw the breeder's equation in some of the talks that were given uh, this week. Um, but it is an important equation. If you're going to memorize one equation, this will be the one to remember. We can increase our gain from selection by increasing the selection intensity, uh, improving the accuracy of our selection procedure, increase the genetic variation, or we can reduce the cycle time. And it's important to remember that the cycle time is in the denominator. So that is going to have the most influence on our gain from selection. 
Okay, so in, in genomic selection, uh, the uh, predominant way of thinking about this is that there are two kinds of populations, a training population and a breeding or candidate population. Um, genomic selection was first introduced uh, in, um, actually in a paper by Haley and Vischer back in 1998, but that's rarely cited. Um, the paper that is most often cited is the Muison, Hayes, and Goddard paper from 2001. And uh, that's because uh, that paper really um, pr put forward the uh, statistical and uh, uh, analysis uh, protocols that were necessary for implementation. So in genomic selection, um, we are uh, trying, we are assuming that we have at least one molecular marker in linkage disequilibrium with every gene affecting the trait. We, uh, uh, we uh, use those genome-wide markers in our statistical model as random effects, and we predict what the breeding value of an individual is by summing those marker effects across the entire genome. And we train that model with both phenotype and genotype and uh, attempt to um, uh, capture the additive genetic effects for that trait of interest. The training population is uh, genotyped and phenotyped for the traits of interest and uh, in the target population of environments. And that phenotypic and genotypic information is used to train a statistical model, and then that's used in combination with genotypes from a breeding population to estimate the breeding value before you actually grow them in a, in a field trial. And that allows you to turn over generations much faster because you don't have to go through a whole growing season before you have an estimate of the value of an individual. So this figure just shows how those two populations work together. The training population is on over here on this side, and it consists of elite lines, typically lines that are closely related uh, to your breeding, pop or your breeding program, your varieties that you use for that target population of environments. And those are phenotyped uh, across uh, the typical environments that you use in your traditional breeding program. Use that in combination with the genotypes to train the model. And then um, you use that in combination with genotypes from either a new germplasm source that is related to your training population or with, uh, in, uh, in combination with genotypes from your uh, advanced uh, uh, inbred populations to estimate their breeding values. And from those breeding values, you then decide which ones are likely to be the best uh, lines, and uh, you uh, either recycle those in your, in your crossing block over here, or, you, or at the same time, you can move them into your advanced testing. And from there, once you've got more phenotypic information, you can recycle those new lines in your, into your training population. You have to periodically update your um, prediction model with, um, with phenotypes and genotypes from your training population because when you add new germplasm, that changes your prediction model. Okay, so there's a lot of factors that affect genomic selection accuracy. Um, Prediction accuracy is affected by LD. Recall, recall that we are assuming that we have at least one molecular marker in linkage disequilibrium with every gene affecting the trait. So if you have low LD and low marker density, you're probably going to miss some of those genes. Sample size is important because that, effect, that uh, determines your effective population size, and effective population size affects the linkage disequilibrium. When you have a larger effective population size, you have lower linkage disequilibrium. Marker type and density is important because you want good distribution of markers across the entire genome, and uh, type of marker is going to affect the costs. For uh, models, um, most of the models will give you similar prediction accuracies. Uh, but there are a few that might work better in certain situations. 
And of course, as I mentioned before, you need to have a close relationship between your training population and your breeding population. So our, our statistical problem is that we're trying to estimate many QTL effects from a limited number of phenotypes. And uh, st this creates statistical problems because you'll oversaturate -satur an ordinary least squares model and uh, uh, you won't capture some of the, uh, uh, you, you won't capture some of the uh, small effect markers. So instead what we do is we um, uh, treat our predictors as random effects and that allows us to estimate uh, all of the marker effects and um, avoids the problem of fixed effects in an ordinary least squares model uh, where uh, you have a set threshold where you, can, you declare something significant if it's above the threshold. That means you're going to miss some of the small effect QTLs and uh, if you have a lot of uh, significant markers, you start, when, you, when that model is saturated, the accuracy starts to decline. So, but with um, uh, linear mixed models, we can, uh, we don't worry about significance. We're using the effects of all the markers. And, and those are included in your models as random effects. So, many of the models uh, differ on, based on our assumptions and how they treat marker effects. The most common uh, statistical model used in genomic selection is probably ridge regression or, or GBLOP. And this approach uh, assumes equal variance of marker effects and equally shrinks all QTL effects towards zero. Some of the other models include the Bayesian models, which uh, you heard Pancho talk about on Sunday. Um, the Bayes-A model uses an inverse chi-square and it, uh, on, on the marker variances in it, uh, produces a, a scaled T distribution and it uses all the markers. Bayes B has a cutoff, a, a pi value that sets a cutoff where, where above a certain uh, level of a marker effect, it's, uh, it's included in the model, but below that, it's, it's given a, a value of zero. Bayesian lasso has a unique uh, distribution. It's a double exponential distribution and this increases the uh, weight on lar uh, markers with large effects and reduces the uh, emphasis on markers with small effects. And then there are non-parametric non methods such as the reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces regression um, and the random forest. But Pancho covered some of those uh, on Sunday. Um, right, so how do we determine the accuracy of these models? We uh, simply do a, a Pearson chi-square correlation between the predicted breeding values and the observed breeding values. And, and that correlation is analogous to the square root of the narrow sense heritability. Okay, so moving to genotype by environment interaction. Nicola Heslow was a, a graduate student at Cornell he now, he's now with uh, Lima Grain, and he used a Lima Grain data set on barley, uh, nearly a thousand lines grown in 58 environments. Um, and uh, this, uh, this was a typical breeding data set in that there were only 18 genotypes present in more than 50% of the environments. He used the Bayesian Lasso GS model so that he could get marker effect estimates. And then he used, um, those marker effects uh, to um, identify outlier environments and group relevant mega environments. And I'll give you some uh, examples there. So one of the interesting things about unbalanced data sets is that um, you are prohibited from making certain kinds of uh, statistical analyses because not all, not all genotypes were tested in all the environments. But when you have whole genome, uh, a whole genome set of markers, those marker effects are present in every single environment. So the marker effects are actually balanced, even though the genotypes are not. 
And that allows you to do, to do things like calculate Euclidean distances. So for, for this, uh, in this figure here, this is a heat map that shows the Euclidean distances among the 58 environments in which those barley genotypes were grown. And, in, uh, and then he simply clustered the marker effects and uh, that's shown at the top there on the side. Those are the phylogenetic trees of the, of the marker effects. And then use that to create this heat map. And in this heat map, the environments that had dissimilar marker effects um, are shown in pink and red. And the environments that had uh, similar marker effects are shown in blue. So uh, this is a, a convenient way to identify outlier environments, environments which, in which the marker effects were very different from the majority of the other environments. Even though you can see a pattern in this uh, heat, uh, heat map, um, when he grouped those environments based on their marker effects, um, he was not able to increase the prediction accuracy. This is a, a, a different kind of heat map based on the reciprocal prediction accuracy between pairs of environments. And, and in this figure, the environments that are positively correlated are in red and pink, and the and environments that are negatively correlated uh, in their prediction accuracy, this isn't marker effects, this is prediction accuracy, are shown in blue. And uh, again, this heat map Shows, shows you which environments are predictive of other environments. And when he grouped environments based on their prediction accuracy, reciprocal prediction accuracy, uh, into, I think it was six, six groups, he was able to significantly improve the genomic selection prediction accuracy. So even though this pattern is not as clear, grouping the environments this way was successful in improving the prediction accuracy. All right, so then he used the same data set to try to identify a subset of environments that were more predictive than the entire group of 58. And to do that, he calculated a mean prediction accuracy for each individual environment and all of the others. And then he ranked those mean prediction accuracies from low to high, and one at a time, he removed the least predictive environments and then he retrained his model to see if the prediction accuracy increased. The unpredictive uh, environments were moved into what he called an unpredictive set, and he took that retrained model, ran it on the unpredictive set to see if the prediction accuracy in the unpredictive set improved. And this figure just shows the results of that experiment. The red circles at the top show the uh, predictive set of environments, and um, the blue triangles are the unpredictive set. The green squares are an independent validation set from a, a subsequent year. When he uh, removed uh, the least predictive environments from the, the total set, starting here with the first and so forth, increasing the number, the prediction accuracy rose from 0.54 to 0.61, and <coughs> When he put those environments down here in the unpredictive set, there was a, initially there was a little bit of a jump, and then it plateaued to about the same place, where about 18 or 19 environments um, uh, removed, maximized the prediction accuracy in, with the remaining with the rain, remaining environments of so about 40 environments. In the validation set, the same saw the same pattern, but the the improvement was not statistically significant that year. So removing these environments that are less predictive resulted in an improvement in the prediction accuracy. In another uh, experiment that Nicola uh, ran, he um, was interested in, in integrating environmental covariates in, uh, from a crop model into the genomic selection framework. The idea was to use environmental data to uh, characterize environments and see if by including those variables in the model, your prediction accuracy would improve. 
For this data set, he used uh, 2,400 elite inbred wheat lines grown throughout France, 44 environments over six years, and he used a SNP chip with 1,200 markers on it. The weather data came from a, a European data set called AgriForecast, and it's, a, it's an EU data set that interpolates climatic data over a 25 grid th kilometer grid throughout Europe. The crop model that he used was uh, serious quality. And I think we've already heard a lot about uh, modeling here in this, uh, in this uh, set of workshops, so um, I won't go into any details on the, on the model per se. Um, okay, so the reason you need to use a crop model when you're combining uh, climatic variables in your prediction models is because you have to synchronize the weather data with the maturity, the stages of development of the wheat crop for each individual variety that is, has a different uh, uh, flowering time and different uh, maturity. Because if you don't, you're going to have, uh, you're, you're, you're gonna have uh, maybe high temperatures at, uh, at flowering uh, for one variety, but that vari a different variety might still be in a vegetative phase. So the plants are going to respond differently when they're at different stages of development. So it's very important to synchronize the climatic data with the stage of development of the varieties. And he grouped the varieties into early, medium, and late maturity. The weather covariates that were chosen were based on known responses of wheat to stress at different stages of development from, from published literature. Uh, for example, there in, uh, in uh, a vegetative stage, uh, excess water can be a stress. Um, drought affects any stage of development. He derived um, a total of 101 stress covariates across different developmental stages. These uh, stress covariates were then used as independent variables in a statistical model. Sorry, I have two equations. But uh, this, is, this, this is the factorial model. And uh, for each marker, he fit a main effect and a sensitivity to each of the stress covariates. Uh, he, he had a machine learning algorithm that was used to capture the interaction between markers and stress covariates and the nonlinearity. When you have thousands of markers and um, potentially hundreds or thousands of, of weather covariates, you run into a dimensionality problem that you have to deal with some way. And the way uh, Nicola dealt with this dimensionality problem was he looked at the variance of the marker effects for each marker across all the environments. And, and then he um, used a statistical approach to find those markers who had, that had a significant variance and contributed to model improvement. In uh, uh, his data set, he had a marker for several major genes, including the photoperiod sensitivity gene, and that happened to have the highest variance, but it was not statistically significant contributor to the overall variance. It was included in the final model, however. The final model used 250 markers and the uh, soft rule algorithm fit level four. This table shows the most important stress covariates, the most important weather covariates that were used uh, in the model, in the final model. The most important um, covariate was the sum of the average daily temperature between meiosis and flowering. And we know that temperature, uh, uh, high temperatures during flowering can cause uh, pollen abortion and partial sterility sometimes. Some of the others included uh, early, early spring drought measured two different ways, heat stress measured two different ways uh, during, before flowering and, and also during early grain fill. Right, so um, including the, the climatic variables, the climatic uh, covariates, um, allowed him to predict G by E for any genotype even if it was not observed in a particular environment. He can use this balanced data set then to cluster environments. Even though the data set, the genotypes were unbalanced, he had predicted G by E's 
for all of the genotypes. This allows uh, one to uh, better understand uh, the structure of the target population environments. And uh, when he ran a clustering algorithm on uh, data sets, he found, as you might expect, that years were grouped together. And this was expected, but there was also a north-south trend within those clusters. And, and if, if you uh, know France, there is a strong north-south uh, change in climate. So, so it allows you to better understand what environments are related with others. And by having uh, that prediction model with uh, the predicted G by E, it allows you to better understand the uh, uh, genotypes, better understand the kinds of genotypes you're selecting in your breeding program. So he looked at the, this figure just shows the uh, rel, uh, rel, prediction accuracy um, with the G by E uh, component in the, in the prediction model and the environment prediction accuracy or the, uh, the prediction accuracy without the G by E component. And so dots above the line uh, indicate that the, the G by E component improved the prediction accuracy. Uh, and you can see that most of the dots are above the line, especially down here where there was lower prediction accuracy in a particular environment. Overall, the, there was 11% increase in the mean prediction accuracy and 11% decrease in the coefficient of variation. So the, the, the nice thing about this approach, it allows you to lose, use some of your knowledge about agronomy. Um, it allows uh, the use of existing breeding data and it's a model that allows you to better understand what kinds of stresses are occurring in your target population of environments. Um, there was some questions about population structure, um, uh, either Sunday or Wednesday, I forget when it was, but uh, this next um, set of experiments that I'm gonna talk about uh, was, was, was an experiment that uh, was a project that Julio Isidro Sanchez ran when he was at Cornell. Um, he looked at the impact of subpopulation structure on prediction accuracy, and to do that, he uh, developed five approaches to sampling subpopulations. Random sampling, stratified uh, selection within the subpopulation based on the coefficient of determination mean selection within the subpopulations based on prediction error variance, and then a combination of stratified sampling and uh, the coefficient of determination mean. He used two different data sets, a wheat data set consisting of uh, a little over 1,000 wheat lines and 38,000 GBS markers, and the rice data set consisted of 405 rice varieties and 36 almost 37,000 SNPs from a rice SNP chip. Uh, the traits uh, for these two populations were, uh, all had pretty high heritability on, on the wheat side, wheat uh, yield, test weight, lodging, heading, date, and height. And on the rice side, um, I can never remember the traits. So um, flowering time, plant height, I'll find them in a minute. Um, okay, so the statistical model, he used GBLOP for everything, and he used Ward's hierarchical clustering for the, group, for the clustering algorithm. This is an example of the wheat data set and how he structured his um, training populations. He started with the uh, wheat data set of 1,100 individuals. A calibration set uh, was separated from a test set, and in that calibration set, uh, he ran a clustering algorithm to generate four clusters. And within those clusters, for the, for the stratified um, sampling, he took a proportional number from each of the clusters to generate different training population sizes over here. And uh, the reason he needs different training population sizes is because he wanted to evaluate the effect of the different sampling protocols on the prediction accuracy. 
the CD mean and a PEV mean and random sampling all came directly from the calibration set. And a combined clustering and stratified CD mean used the CD mean to sample from each cluster. Was the data set completely balanced? So in, in all genotypes in all environments? Or was there uh, <coughs> uh, This wheat data set is also an unbalanced data set. Yeah, um, not nearly as unbalanced as the barley and the wheat data sets, uh, but I would say probably three-fourths of the lines had um, at least uh, 10, or 10 or 12 environments of data. Uh, there were a few lines that would only have uh, three or six uh, environments. So then those uh, different training population sizes were used uh, to predict a test set, an independent test set. This shows a principal components analysis of the, of the wheat uh, breeding lines. Um, they were grouped into four different, uh, four different subgroups, uh, generally had very mild uh, population structure, and the, two, the two first two axes accounted for about 20% of the variation. Down below here, shows, um, this shows green dots, which were the genotypes selected by each algorithm, CD mean, PEV mean, and stratified CD mean. The red dots are the genotypes that were chosen most frequently over the 50 uh, runs. They were selected more than 15 times. The CD mean, you can see, mostly selected genotypes that were in the middle of the principal components um, separation. The PEV mean was really uh, strongly uh, selecting the uh, lines that came from the elite eastern soft white winter wheat group, and that's, uh, those are the more recent lines, the more, uh, more recent lines and varieties, whereas the uh, stratified CD mean the selected individuals were spread out a lot more among the entire population. The rice data set, in contrast, had very high population structure, very strong population structure, and it separated into three clear groups. When we looked at uh, the CD mean, uh, the CD mean was reasonably good at selecting individuals from all three groups. The PEV mean uh, was pretty good at selecting from two groups, not so good from selecting from this group. The stratified CD mean was the best. It selected individuals from all three groups and, and uh, pretty proportional to their sizes. So then we looked at the effect of these different sampling protocols on the prediction accuracy. Um, this is the wheat data set, and we have yield, test weight, lodging, heading date, and plant height, and different, pl different, different population sizes here, prediction accuracy on the y-axis. And in every case except um, for um, test weight and heading date, the, most, the best uh, sampling strategy was, you, was a CD mean and stratified CD mean, so the, the blue and the uh, purple lines tended to be at the top in everything except test weight and heading date. And I'll talk more about uh, those in a bit, but just uh, you'll notice that the black lines uh, in these two were usually at the top in the prediction accuracy. And that was random sampling. In the case of rice, uh, for all four traits, the stratified sampling was the most effective. But we wanted to better understand why two of those traits for wheat were different. And so we first uh, calculated the pr uh, proportion of the phenotypic variance captured by the CD mean versus all of the, uh, versus all of the phenotypic variance. And we plotted that against the relative prediction accuracy for the CD means sampling versus random. And what we found was that in the case of uh, wheat, these two traits 
the CD mean did not capture, fully capture the phenotypic variation as well as it did for the other three traits. There was a similar trend in rice, but it was not nearly as pronounced as it was for the wheat data set. So what this says is that you have to be cautious about how you sample subpopulations uh, or you may um, end up um, missing some of that phenotypic variation. So in, in genomic selection, you can train your models by taking two different approaches. You can either train your model with biparental populations or you can use related multifamily populations. They have different advantages and disadvantages. If you, if you use a biparental population, obviously you have to train your model for each and every new biparental population you create. So that means you have to grow, them, grow this a portion of this population at least for one year in, in maybe multiple locations to train your model. However, if you use multifamily populations and you accumulate data over years and locations, you can train your model uh, for a new related biparental population without having to grow out a portion of that biparental. So this can save you a lot of time. The downside is that when you use multifamily prediction models, they sometimes are less, predict less accurate for prediction and those populations have to be much larger and you have to have more environmental data and you have to have denser marker genotypes to do that. With biparentals, you don't need as many, many markers because LD is maximum. In a biparental population, that maximizes your linkage disequilibrium. You can use smaller training populations. You don't have to worry about allele frequencies because you know that they're going to be centered around 0.5, right? And uh, biparentals are the only approach you can use to introgress exotic material because by definition, exotic material is not in your, in your uh, training population. So that's the only way you can use genomic selection in combination with um, exotic introgressions. So uh, multifamily is more the kind of approach the, the dairy industry uses. They accumulate uh, a lot of phenotypic data over many years and, and many cows, many bulls, and they use uh, that information to build their prediction models. So there's a couple things you can think about if you want to include um, genomic selection in a breeding program. Uh, if you're doing recurrent selection and you want to use genomic selection, you need some sort of a rapid cycling plan, and that's shown on your left, where in, at least with winter wheat, you can, you can only do uh, maybe two cycles per year. You can do a few more if you're speed breeding spring wheat. Um, but with winter wheat, you can plant and harvest twice a year, and you can self, you can cross and self twice a year. From those self plants, you have F2 seed that goes in, that can then go into your inbreeding phase. Now, inbreeding phase, you're, uh, you're, uh, you're able to use speed breeding to begin inbreeding and select for uh, various uh, uh, traits of interest. You can use markers on your inbreeding, in your inbreeding phase. But by the time you get to the F4, you've got to increase the seed supply. So you have to use bigger pots or you have to grow them in the field to get enough seed to put in a, a, a small yield trial plot. When you're doing a recurrent selection, uh, because you're going through meiosis twice a year, you want to use models that emphasize additive genetic effects. Whereas on the inbreeding side, where you have inbred lines and you're predicting inbred lines based on an inbred population, you might be able to capture some of that non-additive genetic variation. And so you might want to use something like RKHS when you get to that stage. But once you have those pure lines, then you need to re-genotype and select those individuals that have the highest predicted breeding value for either advanced testing or recycling in your crossing program. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of uh, Jessica's work, and I have to be very careful because she's here in the audience. Um, most of you know about UG99 uh, and its uh, incredible virulence on major genes. 
if you've heard the talks, you know that it's spread from Ethiopia, Uganda, all the way down into South Africa up and, and up into Iran and Egypt. So uh, we thought it might be interesting to um, use genomic selection to try to select for uh, adult plant quantitative resistance to stem rust. And so I think I don't think I need to explain uh, all stage resistance versus adult plant resistance to this crowd. Her uh, recurrent selection scheme is shown here. Um, she started with a, a few parents, intermated them, selfed them for a generation, and genotyped those for genomic selection and then sent the S fund families to Kenya for evaluation in a stem rest nursery. And based on the uh, predicted breeding values, she recycled those genomic selections, and based on the phenotypic values, she recycled those uh, 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 selected lines from that, from that population. The historical data set consisted of about 370 individuals, and those were grown in at least four environments in Kenya. They had reasonably good heritability of about 0.8, and uh, out of the semit germplasm, she chose 14 parents to be her founders for creating a new population. Those were not selected based on their adult plant stem rust resistance. I think they were mostly selected based on Robbie's recommendation for promising parents in the breeding program, right, Jessica? Yeah. Those were intermated for two generations, and that created what we call the early generations uh, selection candidate set. That was divided into two replicates of 252 individuals each. Those were evaluated in Kenya, uh, I think at least once or twice in one, in one or two environments. And uh, that was probably Kenya and Ethiopia, right? That early, you know, just Kenya? Yeah. Okay, so the heritability on that was about 0.58. The selected individuals consisted of six S1 progenies from five individuals that were intermated. That created the uh, next cycle of selection. The marker data set was uh, about 2,700 GBS markers filtered to 18,000 with less than 20% missing data. This uh, principal components figure shows the uh, original 14 founders in blue, uh, blue circles, and the uh, early generation population in red triangles, and the original historical data set in, uh, in black, black circles. And you can see that uh, there was, there's, there's not a lot of difference between these populations, although the early generation did diverge from the historical population to some extent. This figure shows the prediction accuracies for both the historical population in black and the early generation population in the gray bars for different training set sizes. And you can see that, as expected, the prediction accuracy increases as you increase the training set size. But you also can see that the historical data set was less predictive than the early generation data set. And this is because the early generation data set was more closely related to the, the selection candidates. You can also see that the historical set keeps increasing in prediction accuracy and probably would begin to level off, but not until the population was larger. But you can see in the early generation data set, it's already started to plateau. And this is characteristic of populations that are more or less closely related. When you have less closely related training population, you need a larger population with more molecular markers. So what were the results? Jessica was able to do two generations of genomic selection in the same amount of time as, as one generation of phenotypic selection. Remember, she had two replicates. In replicate one, the phenotypic selection realized gain was greater than a genomic selection realized gain. However, in replicate two, the genomic selection realized gain was greater than the phenotypic selection realized gain. 
And overall, there was not a statistically significant difference from two cycles of genomic selection versus one cycle of phenotypic selection. And this is just shown here in this, in this figure. And you can see also in the second cycle of genomic selection, the slope increased on the gain. And this was because in the second cycle, she used the early generation population to train her model. The expected uh, and realized gain was about the same. Um, she evaluated all of her populations in both Kenya and Ethiopia. The correlation uh, between Kenya and Ethiopia was 0.66, which to me suggests that the, um, even though there was a different race of stem rust in Ethiopia, that the adult plant stem rust resistance was effective in providing resistance to multiple races. Um, I think that was all I wanted to say there. Um, when she looked at the inbreeding, there was much more inbreeding from the genomic selection than there was from the phenotypic selection, and that reduced the, also reduced the genetic variance more uh, from genomic selection than for uh, phenotypic selection. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that with spring wheat, you should be able to do uh, at least three or four cycles in one year versus one cycle of phenotypic selection. So uh, even though the genomic selection wasn't better than the phenotypic selection with just two cycles of selection, assuming that we can get the same prediction accuracy over three or four cycles, we should be able to uh, beat the phenotypic selection. Also, keep in mind that we are only using our prediction models for one trait here. If you train your model for other traits, like, like uh, grain yield or, or maturity or, or quality, you can use the same genotypes to predict the favorable uh, segregates for those traits as well. So even though you have, to, you have the cost, added cost of genotyping, you can actually reduce your overall program cost by training your model for different sets of, for different phenotypes. Well, so everybody always wants to know, does genomic selection really work? And besides Jessica's publication, there are a couple other publications that report favorable results from genomic selection. One is by Asoro et al on genomics, using genomic selection for improving beta-glucan content in oat. Another one is uh, uh, Massman et al, uh, using genomic selection uh, to improve grain yield and stover quality traits for, for maize. So I think it's still early in the game, but so far the results have been pretty promising. And I think once we begin to better understand how to optimize our training population, uh, figure out how to maximize our prediction accuracies, I think it's going to get better. And every, every time we run these experiments, we learn something new. So the genotyping is an added cost. Um, you can't just use one recipe for incorporating genomic selection into every breeding program. Every breeding program is different. There are no two breeding programs that are identical. And that means you have to think carefully about where in your breeding program genomic selection is going to work, or if it will work at all for you. Um, we need ways to figure out how to optimize genomic selection methods. And we really need to move away from this black box approach where you're just putting in numbers and getting out a breeding value. Try to work out approaches and ways to use the information from genomic selection to figure out what is actually going on in your, in your population and in the genomes of the, of the genotypes that you're working with. Do some retrospective analysis to try to understand why and how traits are changing in your breeding populations. So just to summarize, genomic selection is complementary to marker-assisted selection and association breeding. It doesn't require 
knowledge of the underlying biological mechanisms that are affecting your traits, but you can use genomic selection to generate new populations and through retrospective analysis better understand those. We can see that integrating environmental covariates and crop modeling into the genomic selection framework can allow us to better predict G by E and uh, understand, better understand the genetic architecture that controls genotype by environment interaction. And this is really important for plant breeders. We all know how difficult it is to deal with genotype by, by environment interaction. But the most important advantages are redu reductions in the length of the cycle and associated phenotyping costs allowing greater genetic gain per year. Well, we get funding from a, a bunch of different sources. We've, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have been very generous with us. Um, the USDA has provided a lot of support for um, both Jessica and for uh, our Tritacy CAP project. And uh, Lima Grain provided support for Nicola Heslow. And uh, we get funding from the US Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative. Uh, we're especially grateful to the Kenya Agriculture Research Institute for building and maintaining and allow us, allowing us to use the stem rust screening nursery. And of course, to our wonderful collaborators at CIMIT. We, without them, we wouldn't be able to get a lot of the things done we do. This is an old picture now, but you can, you can see over here a familiar face. Um, I was, what, about four years ago, I guess, Jessica. Um, and this is John Luke here. We work really closely with John Luke Yannick's research group. We meet, uh, we have lab meetings and journal club meetings twice a week. So, um, uh, yeah, it's a good working relationship. They do a lot of the theoretical, theoretical work and we try to make it work in the field. All right, so there I'll stop and I'll be glad to try to answer any questions you might have.